So I manage the outpatient services over at the Cathcart Center. We serve both mental health and substance abuse clients. We're in suite 220 on the second floor. I, I gave you all a brochure about our services and our psychiatrists who are there with us, Dr. Pollard and Dr. Nelson. So when you signed up today, you read, a bro you read a little flyer, and that flyer said that we were going to talk about the disease process, best treatment practices, and relapse prevention. And so you're probably, well, I don't know if you're wondering why I would have titled it Just Say No Isn't Enough. But I did indeed entitle, or title this program um, that because I have found in communities our size, particularly, that is, there's a great stigma regarding substance abuse treatment and addiction in general. So everybody wants to hide, but everybody around them knows the truth, right? Except them, typically. So. I said that because, you know, God bless Richard Nixon and Ronnie Reagan, but Richard Nixon's was the war on drugs. And Nancy's slogan was, just say no. And neither have worked. Neither have worked. Now, is there a place for incarceration of criminals? Certainly there is. But the answer to the solution in the 70s was, let's incarcerate everybody, dry them out for a few months, and it'll be solved. Well, that didn't work, because guess what? They got out, and they didn't receive much in any way form of treatment. And so the disease process continued to manifest itself during incarceration, and that happens today. Secondly is, when we say, just say no, what we're saying is, if you can't, you must not have the willpower to do so. Right? Because if you could just say no, then you shouldn't have a problem. A lot of people still believe that. We call that the moral model in this country. A lot of people still believe that that if you were just strong enough, able enough, hardworking enough, pull up your bootstraps enough, you could just decline the drink. Or you could just decline the drug. And what I'm here to teach you today is that is absolutely, unequivocally, unsubstantiated malarkey. And I feel very strong in that, and I know that's a very strong statement. But I say that because I think the only way as a community is for us to believe the truth. And to me, you learn the truth through education. So that's why we're doing this today. It's the inception, if you will, of our attempts to educate the, the Park County community and surrounding communities in truly what, what the disease of addiction is, why we treat it how we do, and how we can prevent relapse from what we know. So that's what we're going to talk about today. I'm going to start with a couple of YouTube videos. So pardon my clunkiness, because I have to like do some special things <laughs> that I'm not very good at. I'd like to make this full screen. There it is. Oh, well, we're going to start. Oh, no, we didn't.
you don't mind. And the braiding up on the right, yeah. Mm -hmm. Can you hear it? Understand it. Uh, that, that's what, what I'm trying to do here. I want to explain a couple of things quickly. First of all, this idea that Wait. someone has uh, some sort of anticipation of taking a substance. Uh, what should I do? Oh, they can't hear it. What if you play the, the speaker on your laptop, put your microphone to that speaker? That's what we were trying to do. That's what I was doing, but I couldn't get it to do anything. We have it all the way up. have it on the audio here? I don't know. Let's try I'm sorry. I'm going to go again. That's sort of the first step. But then there are two important steps after that in the brain. And stay, stick with me here. So, so imagine, for example, as you take a look at this animation I'm about to show you, that someone takes a, a drug of some sort. What happens there, and this is the middle of the brain, is that there is a sense of euphoria. That's dopamine there, no small little You can't hear it. That makes you feel good. That, is it that's, any kind of drug? I mean, are we talking everything from cocaine to Xanax? Yeah, there, there, anything. There, just, just about any kind of drug. Not even drugs necessarily. There can be other things too, certain food substances, sugar, for example. There can be a certain addiction for it. But I think what's important is the next step. So you have that euphoria, but in someone who's a true addict, take a look at this picture here. Uh, on the left side of the brain is, you see the bright areas? That's still feeling good. That's the euphoria. But on the right side is someone who has an addiction now, not as much of that bright spot, and that is relevant. Why? Because they need more and more of the substance to try and get that euphoria back. Think about that for a second. You take the substance, you feel good, but in an addict, that, that good feeling doesn't last. So what do you do? You take more, you more than ever before. More. And that's sort of the, the basic, sort of simplistic, but basic form of addiction. Are those changes permanent? Well, th they last a long time. And, and exactly how long is it? Is a little bit of a, a subject of controversy. But people say you can eventually get to the point where your brain does feel natural pleasure again, but that can take some time. What doesn't go away is this idea of the memory of the addiction. constant battle to stay away from the temptation or feel that euphoria, right? That's right. People say that, but I wanted to show the pictures of the brain to really explain why that is. Okay. You see that, that dark areas of the brain, you need okay. a lot I'm of I'm going to let us go to on to the, back. back to the PowerPoint. So I just wanted to show that, and I'm sorry you couldn't hear it very well, but I just, I changed this mic on me because I was like sweating. So can you, okay. Um, <clears throat> yeah, agree. So I, uh, I showed Dr. Gupta because, you know, I, I don't know what it said on that, 2012, 13. We've been talking about this for a long time. So um, I'm going to just go on to show you more evidence. If we could get to full screen, please. Thank you. Okay. Okay. So what Dr. Gupta talk, talked about, and I told you the first thing we're going to talk about is the disease of the brain. So it's not, it, I hope it's as exciting as I can make it for you. But the truth is, is you have a little part of your brain right in there. It's called the pleasure center, and it's the nucleus accumbens. 
And what your nucleus accumbens does for you is it tells you when you're experiencing pleasure and when you're not. So when you eat a piece of cheesecake and that tastes good to you, your little nucleus accumbent is sending out little dopamine. Ooh, that feels good. I like that. <laughs> Next week, you'll be approached with another piece of cheesecake. And your little memory here is going to say, I like cheesecake. Let's pretend you ate bad cheesecake tonight and you wake up during the night from food poisoning, God forbid. Guess what next week when you're offered the piece of cheesecake? Not going to look so good. Because your brain, your memory says, that doesn't bring me pleasure. So this is the brain, and it's this cluster of neurons that modulates. If we call this neurotransmitter, I said, woo! The neurotransmitter is dopamine. Dopamine is what's released when you ingest something or do something that you experience pleasure from. Yeah, it doesn't matter if it's exercise or if it's cheesecake. The same neurotransmitter is generated and hops around in your brain. Now, if you're not an addict, you walk or if you're not an addict, you're not addicted to anything, you feel relatively serene walking around in this world, you're sleeping at night, you're relatively healthy, you walk around with about 100 units of dopamine going at any given time in your brain. You walk around like that. And that's what humans, that is the, essentially what we would call a baseline of dopamine. 250, if you smoke a cigarette, how many here have smoked a cigarette before? You feel the pop, that's 250. An orgasm is 200. <laughs> when you exercise, how many have exercised and then experienced the sense of ease and comfort after exercise? You know, you feel that kind of calm. <sighs> That's the do your dopamine has escalated to a point where you are experiencing a sense of ease and comfort and harmony with the world, that all is well. And then you wake up at the next morning and guess what? You're back at 100. That's how our brain works. 1,800 units is what the average addict needs of dopamine to feel the same sense of ease and comfort that you feel if you were ever addicted to cigarettes and needed a cigarette and then smoked it, if you've ever exercised and experienced that sense of ease and comfort and calm and relaxation. An addict has to go clear to here to get the same experience. Why? Because they've taught their brain, whoops, they've taught their brain that they need that much neurotransmitter dopamine activity to feel okay. We know this to be true. When you have that much activity going on in your brain for that long, you change your brain. It's not much different than a car accident, except a car accident happens acutely from a trauma and addiction happens over time. But the same deteriorative symptoms occur. 
Anyone ever seen a patient with what we call wet brain? End stage alcoholism. Looks like they've been in a motor vehicle accident and can't talk, can't speak, or massive stroke. It all looks the same. This is why we say that addiction will ultimately lead to jails, institutions, or death. And in that first video you saw, it will ultimately lead to death. Because if your pleasure center says you have to have this much dopamine to feel okay, guess what? Your other organs are suffering. It can't help it cardiovascularly, everything is affected because you need this much. So that's why we call it a brain disease because we know for sure your brain changes. You saw the pictures that Dr. Gupta showed of you know, the brain um, and how much you know, smaller the activity is in the brain. It's because we kill, we kill all of these wonderful cells in our brain is what, what happens with addicts. That's why they become slower, slower to respond. If you notice, the gait will start to slow eventually. Words will start to slow. Conversation begins to slow. And that's all a, a brain deterioration. That's the disease of addiction, untreated. That's the ugly part of the illness that we treat. So. Can we cure you, people? Can we cure people? Well, that's kind of asking if you can cure diabetes. We manage diabetes, right, by your blood sugar levels, your glucose levels. And the way we manage that is we keep it at a constant baseline therapeutic level where your pancreas is happy. It's not too high, right? Your organs aren't having to work too hard. That's the best way that we can describe if you're cured from an addiction. You know, they say with cancer often, it's in recession. They don't say cured very often or remission, recession, remission. Those are words we like to use with addiction because people who have an addiction don't get to forget that they do in order to sustain wellness. You don't get to decide when you be treated for, um, for um, stage two breast cancer that you're gonna say, to your oncologist, I'm never coming back again because you said I'm in remission. You don't get to do that if you want to live. We'll treat you again, right? Get Put it back into remission again. Addiction is the same. It's a treatable disease, a treatable illness, but it requires constant vigilance. Very similar to diabetes. If you if you've if you yourself or been ever around someone has to constantly take the pin prick, measure their their sugar level, et cetera, et cetera. It's a constant diligence. So when somebody says to you, I haven't drank for five years, I'm good, they're wrong. They are wrong. When someone says to you, I haven't used for 20 years, I'm good, they're wrong. And I will show you how we know they're wrong. So I said, let's go talk about the disease. Now we're going to talk about treatment. So what do we treat in people? Well, let's put it this way. If you have a friend out there who's an alcoholic and drinking every day and they say, I'm just going to lock myself in my house and not drink for three days and then come out, please don't let them do that because they could die. The seizure activity that transpires, alcohol withdrawal, is one of the most serious withdrawals that we deal with and believe it or not, the most prevalent 
withdrawal that we deal with in hospitals across the country. So when patients first stop using, it's the physical and emotional symptoms. I never, you know, if, you, if, if there is a heavy user or a heavy drinker, I never am an advocate for just go to AA and see how it goes for you. Now you're gonna see real quick that I'm a real proponent of 12 step self-help groups, but I'm not a proponent. And, and God bless the people who have 20 and 30 years of sobriety or recovery who did it through Alcoholics Anonymous or Narcotics. God bless them. Because we can make it a lot less painful than it used to be today. We really can. And we can bring people farther along more quickly than what we used to be able to do by the medications that we have. Now, I'm not gonna talk to you about specific medications because I'm not a physician, but I will tell you that we use them and they're quite effective. And no, we're not, sub sub we're not substituting one for the other. We are helping a person in their initial stages of recovery to get sober or get clean and we'll proceed in the recovery process. But for us to ignore the ability for medications to treat our patients would be such a grave disservice in the medical community. So that's why we use them. So that's withdrawal. And staying in treatment, I'm gonna show you that the longevity in treatment is the answer. How long somebody keeps going to something is the answer for true lifelong recovery. And we have, t we have some really, really g great research to prove that to us. And science has taught us. That's why I said to you, if somebody tells you they've been sober for 20 years and they don't need to do anything about it, science has taught us that stress cues linked to the drug experience, people, places, and things, and exposure to drugs are the most common triggers for relapse. Medications to help interfere with these triggers to help patients sustain recovery. There are people who have 20 years of sobriety and they go to the ball field and they relapse on a beer because that's what they did 30 years ago. Now, if I'm doing a speaking engagement like this and I talk to people about how much recovery they have, and talk about relapse. The hands, you know, how many relapse after a year? Quite a bit. After five, kind of a medium, about moderate amount. After 20. In a group of 100 people, there's still three to five people who have relapsed after 20. Easy. That's fair and typical, and that's, I'm not just quoting the, that, those numbers off the top of my head. That's what's true. Five out of 100 after 20. If they're not prepared to deal with life. So you saw in the first, in the first um, slide I showed you that one in 10 people will get treatment for addiction. Now why do you think that is? Denial. Embarrassed? Denial. Denial. Financial. But I told you that's not an excuse we can have in Cody. Lazy, stigma. Yeah, it, it ain't easy getting sober, that's for sure. They like it. Well, sure. They like it. No. No, no, I just like it Right. It feels a lot better that way. A lot better that way than to experience what I really have to. My dopamine at 100 sucks for addicts and alcoholics. That is not a pleasant way to live if you're an addict or alcoholic. And for the first five years, when you're fighting to get down there to 100 units, is not pleasant. Pretend you're hungry all the time. That's what it is. That's the, that's the feeling of the crave. And it's pretty constant. And we know, but we know, we know how to abate it. We know what works. It's just getting people to buy in that will stick with them to get them through it so that they're not so lazy to say, this might be worth it. So, one in 10. So I talked to you about in withdrawal 
And oftentimes, symptomatology of craving for some folks is extremely difficult, difficult opiate addicts in particular. It keeps opiate addicts using because being sick and tired and throwing up and body, just imagine feeling like you had the flu all the time, you know, or the worst flu you ever had. That's how it's, that's how it's explained. The worst flu you ever had. So just to abate that, to make that stop, will be the next opiate hit. But, so we got the medications I talked to you briefly about. Behavioral treatments help people engage in substance use disorder treatment, modifying their attitudes and behaviors related to drug use, increasing life skills, handle stressful and environmental cues that may trigger and prompt another cycle. Behavioral therapies can also enhance the effectiveness of medications and help people remain in treatment longer. We know that's for sure to be true. If you have depression and you go to your primary care physician and he writes you an anti antidepressant, you have a 30% chance of going into remission with your depression. If you come to my treatment center and you don't take any medication, but you get counseling, you got a 30% chance of getting back to baseline from your depression. If you take the medication and you come to behavioral therapy and treatment, you have a 60% chance of going into remission. The same is true for addiction. The same is true for addiction. The hardest thing for addicts to do is to follow directions. It's very hard to admit defeat. That's very difficult and it takes people to the grave. And so we like to talk to people about making a different decision to come into treatment and just to give it a shot. Just give it a shot. You know, you've been using and drinking for 20 years. We're asking you for 28 days. We're asking you for 28 days just to give it a shot and let's see what happens. That's how we approach it. Because trust me, the punitive stuff, they just shut you out of their life, don't they? Yeah. The punitive stuff does not work. You're dealing with someone, someone with a disease. When you tell them you're not going to speak to them ever again, if they don't go into treatment, what are you telling them? If you loved me enough, you'd stop. Would you say that if they had cancer? Probably not. That's the truth of addiction. So what do we do? to treat these people. Now we got them in the door, we got them through the first hump of withdrawal, usually a week, as far as a real active withdrawal where we, we have to give medications to the point of to, to lower blood pressure, lower heart rate, keep their pulse ox, their oxygen level constant. Once we get them through that, now what do we do? Great, now you got them out of the withdrawal, so what? And most people can stop anything for three days. That is, not the, that is not the difficult part, particularly when we're medicating them. Addiction is a complex treatable disease. No single treatment is right for anyone. And I'm gonna show you more about that. There is not one single treatment that's gonna work for everybody, unfortunately. And we've learned that time and time again, haven't we? Just say no, the war on drugs. It would be great if one just slogan would fix it, but it will not. We address all patients' needs. Staying in treatment long enough is critical. I'm gonna to continue to talk about that. Counseling and behavior therapies, medications, treatment plans, review, treatment should address other possible disorders. To ignore the fact that somebody was in Vietnam on the front line and watched death around them for two years is preposterous. To not understand that that may be influencing in some way, shape or form their use, not an excuse but an influence. And so for us to, 
Now, granted, somebody doesn't walk into Cedar Mountain Center and we sit down and say to them, now tell me about your history in Vietnam. The first thing we're going to say to them is, we're going to try to help you keep sober today, and this is how. Maybe two weeks after that, three weeks after that, we'll continue the course. But step one is putting it down. Because right now they can't think for squat anyway. So it's better to just try and stay, keep, give people support to keep them sober one day at a time. Um, treatment doesn't need to be voluntary to be effective. A lot of people believe that. If you don't want it, you don't need it. You can't have it. That's bunk. What we know is court-ordered treatment is effective for people who walk in on their own free will. People stay sober as long in court-ordered treatment. It's just such, you know, I don't, you know, it's just, I, I often think in treating addicts and alcoholics, How many of you are the sandwich generation? You got kids and you got parents. And you've watched and you've had to be the caregiver for both. It's kind of like that with addicts and alcoholics. Sometimes you just got to tell them what's best for them. And you just say, we need you to trust us. We just need you to trust the process with us. Because if you do, we can give you some hope. And of course, we test for other diseases all the time, so we can be treating everyone wholly, okay? So I'm going to talk to you about the MATCH clinical trial. And the MATCH clinical trial was probably the most, unfortunately, it was back in 89, but it's still the most encompassing long-term research project that has yet to be done to date regarding treatment for addiction. And what the MATCH project did was an eight-year multi-site, $27 million investigation. We wanted to find out how do we get people sober and how do we keep them there? How do we do that? So at the time, three, big, three types of therapies were big in treatment facilities, and they still are today. There's no, there's no negating the usefulness of cognitive behavioral therapy. Cognitive behavioral therapy teaches people if you think differently, you're gonna feel differently and then you're gonna act differently. That's what cognitive, think cognition first, behavior second. That's what that therapy is in a nutshell. Motivational therapy says I'm gonna build on what you already do well to help you have the courage, hope, and fearlessness to tackle this disease. So I'm going to show you what you already got going for you. I'm going to point that out to you. I'm going to help you build on those strengths. That's what motivational therapy is. And then 12-step facilitation or self-help groups. You're going to see me shortened it in here for SHGs. 12-step 12, 12 programming, Alcoholics Anonymous, Narcotics Anonymous, Al-Anon. These are our 12-step facilitation therapies. So they, they looked at all three of these. They measured all these people who did all this. And guess what they found out? It didn't matter. It did not matter. What mattered was the time that you spent in treatment. Where can you spend the longest amount of time in treatment in this country? What? Possibly. Where? Right at your back door. 12-step self-help groups. You have in Cody, Wyoming, four a day. that you could go to whether you're one day sober or 30 days sober or 30 years sober. And staying in treat, and that is a form of treatment that the match, that the match um, research showed us is the longer you stay, the better likelihood you're gonna stay sober forever. So guess what it found out? People who did cognitive behavioral therapy, left treatment, did not go to AA, relapsed in one year, the majority. 
people who did motivational interviewing, left treatment, did not do um, 12 help step, step groups, relapsed in a year. People who engaged in one of those treatments in 12 step self-help groups had a better percentage at five years and at 16 years of recovery by 50% if they started going while they were in treatment. They stay going. It is free care for the rest of your life. And you know, 12 step, us psychology gurus, Self-help groups gotten kind of a bad rap in the late 90s, 2000s. We said we can do better. We can do better with this, we can do better with that, but we, we still haven't found anything that does better. We haven't. That's the truth. The truth is, is when you have support and like-minded people in the same place, you stay well. And that, I don't know if you, you think about yourself, do you belong to a church? Do you belong to a group? Think where you feel safe. Do you keep going back? Yes, you do. Why do you keep going back? Because you enjoy it. It's a supportive environment. You feel similar to those people. It offers you strength, support, and hope. I don't care if it's work, church, a community group, whatever, right? You keep going because your pleasure center is activated when you're in there. And you remember that. I put this little, I go home today, the rat's talking or mouse is talking. They cured me using this new miracle drug. I'm afraid it will be years before it's approved for humans. <laughs> so I'm gonna talk about relapse prevention. I said that was my last one. I told you about treatments and you can go leave here and say that crazy lady at Cody Regional House is still talking about 12 step self-help groups. And I say, yep, because that's what the research tells us. And that's what we call it evidence-based best practice. And we know that for sure to be true. So do people who get sober actually stay sober? Can't you ever be free of addiction? Are you always at risk for relapse? Is there some period when like cancer? Isn't staying sober for a long time at least somewhat protective? So this is the MATCH study I just briefly talked about. The study concluded that patient treatment matching is not necessary, because, and you, we could put addiction treatment, because the three techniques are equal in effectiveness. They all work the same. If you get that for 12 weeks, when you walk out, you're, you're, you're the measures, what we're measuring all through all three now, the people that went to 12-step self-help groups were also in treatment at the same time. Just know that, okay? Treatment alliance between formal treatment and self-help groups provides the best outcome. When we do both and, like I said, medication and treatment, when we do treatment and self-help groups, both and, two times as likely to achieve the abstinence than those who participate in formal treatment alone at both one year and 16 year follow-up studies. 40% of patients who dropped out of the first year reported substance related problems at a one year follow-up. So if you don't stay in treatment, the odds of using again are very high. Probably after even five years, if you don't stay in some form, 50%. We're going to, people are going to relapse, 50%, if they don't stay in some form of connectedness in a self-help group or, or self-support group. So why is this relapse so problematic, Heidi? Why is this so problematic? So you treat them, you get them engaged in the 12-step self-help groups in Cody, you tell them they have to go, they get out, they keep going, why is the relapse so high? Well, let me ask you this. Why does the diabetic eat a piece of cheesecake? Look, the relapse for drug addiction is at 40 to 60%. And guess what? For my high blood pressure, yeah, I take my lisinopril, but you think I'm exercising and not eating cheesecake? It's 50 to 70% relapse. It's a disease of relapse. 
To not relapse is the anomaly, is the victory. We, dr drug addicts and alcoholics, relapse less than folks with asthma who do not use their nebulizers the way they're supposed to, or people who have hypertension who do not diet or exercise or take their medicine like they're supposed to. They relapse more. Even more proof of why it is the disease process at work in the brain. Doesn't mean treatment has failed. You know, the chronic nature, listen, folks will tell you who have used or drank for a long time say that has been my solution until it turned into my problem. It was my solution. Many Alex, alcoholics and addicts that you know today would probably not have survived, would have died by suicide had they not had the alcohol or the drug. So when folks say that in earnestness, they've saved themselves often. So the chronic nature of the disease means that relapsing is not only possible, but likely. For people with addictions and other substance use disorders are similar to well understood chronic medical illnesses like diabetes, hypertension, and asthma, which also have physiological and behavioral components. Changing deeply embedded behaviors. You know, we're asking people who have drank or used for 23 years, 20 to 30 years, to stop. It's all the way they know how to live. We have to teach everything over again. We teach everything. Because folks do not know how to live without it. It's been their solution. <clears throat> so, relapse prevention. So how do we work with this number, that 40 to 60%? of addicts and alcoholics are going to relapse sometime within the first five years of recovery. And that is what the evidence tells us. The most effective, the most thorough attempt to understand who stays sober is an eight-year study, 1200, able to follow up on over 94% of the study participants, and they found that extensive abstinence really does predict long-term recovery. Extended abstinence is the best indicator. Only about a third of people who are abstinent, yes, less than a year, will remain there. For those who achieve a year, 50% are going to relapse, 50% will stay in, and if you make it to five years, you're going to, the odds of you making it to 15 are good. Why? Because for those five years, you've done the right thing in treating your addiction, or you wouldn't have made it to five years. That's why we know longevity and treatment is the key. So my experience with, with the treatment of, of folks um, 20 years or more, um, they do relapse, but if they get years under their belt, the odds of staying in sobriety and the recovery are good. How do people stay in, in sobriety and recovery? That's right. That's how they stay in. Now, it could be a church group. It could be, because there's, there's, there's some self-help groups that, that have come out of, out of the foundlings of Christianity, and that's okay, as long as it's not a 12-week self-help group, because the answer is not going to be found in the amount of information I can absorb in 12 weeks. The answer is going to be found in my willingness to be honest with you every week for 15 years. What we know is going to one meeting a week in continued recovery 
does is let's say after five years you're only doing one meeting a week is as effective as if people are going to five in early recovery. Does that make sense? That we know for sure to be true. So what happens? So people come out, get better, fall down, break a bone, doctor pres prescribes Percocet, and guess what's activated? That starts all over again. And the, it's the, the, and people will tell you, people who have lots of years of recovery say, oh God, I gotta go to the dentist, I'm gonna have to fight the cravings for the next week, because I'm gonna have a root canal. It, it does that. The brain goes right back because it takes that dopamine level back up again and it takes a little time to come back down to the hundred where the normal people in the world walk around at a hundred units. So often the people who relapse have stopped engaging in recovery oriented practices, serve them well during their early sobriety and lifelong recovery practices. I'm going to share with you. You know, if you have a family member, or a friend, or you yourself, and you're thinking, God, I hate those day meetings. All I do is cuss them old timers all the time. I hear that all the time around here. Or NA, it's a bunch of drug addicts sitting there talking, talking smack to each other, da 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 da. You know, the ticket to recovery is total surrender and willingness. And anytime somebody walks in a meeting, if they can't get something out of it and understand that that's their lifeline for life and can't tolerate a little bit of something's carrying on, I will tell you it is their disease talking. It is their disease talking to keep them out of that room. Because when the disease speaks, it's very powerful, very powerful. And we could come up with all kinds of reasons to listen to it. All kinds of reasons. I don't fit in there. I don't need that. It's too hard. I'm not that bad. My life is fine. I got a job. For now. My response is, I'm not that bad. I always say, yet. We're just trying to stop you before you do. So I got 10 minutes because I wanted to leave a little time for questions. If I don't know the answer, I'll say I just don't know and I'll try to get back to you. Yeah. So is, are, there res, um, are there resources for coping strategies? You know, like the, the drink, the alcohol was a solution. The drugs was a solution. Are there? Are there other coping, a list of coping strategies that we can offer people to try to, maybe it will trigger dopamine, mm -hmm. like some of these other, but it'll be healthy. Mm -hmm. But is there a, a large amount of resources or are there techniques that, or strategies we can offer? Uh, mm -hmm. And so the way we treat, uh, the way we treat um, addiction today is what I like to say body, mind, and spirit. We have to touch every per piece of the person. So we, talk, we, we engage folks in a lot of practices. We engage folks in exercise again. We engage folks in some type of spirituality again. They can't be the their higher power. They can't be the be all end all in the world. So we teach that and an acceptance of that. And we teach every day how to cope with walking by the bar. Or if I can't go down that aisle of the grocery for the first year, what do I do? I've had clients who didn't go by themselves to the grocery for a year. I have clients who have 20 years of recovery who have still not walked back in to the Proud Cut or Silver Dollar because they can't. 20 years of sobriety and it still triggers for them. 
So we teach, how do you stay away? What do you do? So I'm not going into Proud Cut anymore. Now what do I do with every eight hours of an evening after work, right? That's where we teach. Because people who drink and use at the end are drinking and using alone, you see. What, what starts as a party ends up as a big old pity party in self-isolation. And so what we teach people is how to engage in the world again, and that always includes other people because we are not meant to be isolated and alone, and that's a big part of it. So is there a list? Oh, God, I wish there was a list. But the list is as, adva as vast as each of your idiosyncrasies of your character. That's how big the list is. Mm -hmm. uh, well, I was wondering about family history or the uh, alcohol gene or mm -hmm. something like that. Is that, mm -hmm. can you share something? I sure can. I, I, I smoked back in the day, and I'll never forget when I came clean with my doctor, I was like 25 or something, and I told her, I, and she knew my family history, and I said, oh, God, I started smoking. And she said, well, when did you pick up? I said, during college. And she said, the minute you picked up that cigarette, girl, you were doomed. Both of my parents smoked. Both of my maternal grandparents on both sides all smoked. My whole entire, my aunts and uncles, everybody smoked. My brain was ready for the hit of nicotine. My brain was ready. All it needed was it to jump that dopamine right up there and make me feel awesome. So I, I really do have a brain disease. I, I always say I'm brain, I'm, I've got a brain disorder. We have learned that the genetic component of addiction is significant and relevant. If you have a, a parent or a grandparent who is an addict or an alcoholic, it would be really easy for you to cross over that invisible line from social use and drink to I have to because your brain is ready and charged to do that. I always tell that to my folks who are spouses or where they're like, oh my God, my grandmother, my father. I'm like, it's not that far away. Trust me, it's not that far away. It's true for everyone. And that's when the alcoholic says, I took the first drink and God, I felt like I was home. Some of you took your first drink, puked all over the car, and said, I'll never do that again. <laughs> the alcoholic brain puked all over the car and said, maybe I ought to try Jim Beam next time. <laughs> That's how the brain was ready. Question, back, question. Yeah, so... Yeah, so not a lot. We have individual counseling for kids. Schools have some stuff going. Group, support. Group supports are not happening. And you know what's so funny? Not funny. At Cody Regional Health, part of our grant is that we can offer adolescent groups for addiction. We've attempted, they've attempted almost every year for the past five years to try. We cannot get them in. We cannot get more than one, two showing up. Is that peer pressure? Is that, is that I think it's that, I just think that parents don't want to fight it. I, it's just too big of a battle. Who's going to want to fight that every night to, to shove Jimmy in the car and get to the, I mean, I just really, that's what we've experienced. Until they're part of the court system. Then they, then it's a, duh, duh, then all of a sudden it's a different story. And Heidi, I'm sorry, if I could speak to that, because I yeah. worked with that grant, with the Drug and We 
we may, we're gonna, we'll try again. We're going to try again in 18. See if we can do her. I got one of my staff going out to Powell High School and this every, about once every month, and he does a whole series of lectures in, in classroom. So we're going out. It's just bring him in for the consistency and the commonality that I have with my peer. That's how kids get sober. We know that for sure. Question. Uh, when you were reviewing principles of effective treatment, you passed over uh, the note of monitoring drug use during treatment. Mm -hmm. Is that because the harm reduction model is so controversial? I need you to show me exactly where you're pointing at on which slide. What page, what page and what slide? Under Oh, that would be, okay, page six, yeah. The next to the last line, drug use during treatment. Oh, sure. Be monitored continuously. Sure. Uh, when I was uh, uh, taking the glasses for the peer specialist uh, from Recovery Wyoming, they mentioned uh, the harm reduction model, mm -hmm. they called it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it is. It is. You know, we, and did anybody see the TV spot on NBC Color 8 that I did last Sunday, not this past Sunday, the Sunday before? Did anybody see that? Great, great advertisement. <laughs> not one person watches the 10 o'clock news. Okay. Anyway, so she put it on there. This is the truth about medication assisted treatment. Medication-assisted treatment, if you read up on it, it began in urban areas. Why? To keep people alive. Why? So they weren't using dirty needles, shooting up in the back of alleys, overdosing, and then dying in their own vomit. That is why we started harm reduction medication-assisted treatment programs. We bring them in, they get clean needles, they get, we monitor their vitals, et cetera, et cetera. It happens in lots of urban communities, and that's where it was, began. What we learned, is that people who are opiate addicts, who have pain, have to have an opiate. Or they can't live, or they can't survive. You see? So if we have, if you've broken your back in four places, good luck getting out of bed without any help. Because it won't happen. We have people today alive and well on a medication that they don't get high off of but they can get out of bed. That's what it's for. So when if somebody, if I'm in pain and I drop, break, break my back in four places and somebody said, you're a previous addict, I'm not gonna give you something, and the difference is between me being able to get out of bed and live a life and not, and I go to see a physician every week or every month, I'm gonna pick that. And we're going to keep pick that too, because otherwise what happens is people in pain overshoot the mark every time, every time, and then they die. And so what we have to do is monitor it, keep people out of, as, and trust me, every person in our pain, in, in our, what we, I would call a pain clinic mat program, medication assisted treatment program, every person in there without it would not be able to function. At least certainly the majority. Titration is always the goal. Total abstinence is always the goal. In our philosophy, yes. Amen. <laughs> and we are, you know, I, I've, I'm learning, I've not been, I've been here since early December, so I'm learning the, the, the tribes around Cody, and I'm getting ready to make my way. 
and I will see how I met with the prosecuting attorney of Cody. I don't know. I'm just, yeah, I'm just, you know, so I'm going in front of, I, if somebody's giving me some names, I'm going in front of all of them. But I'm going to do it one at a time because I'm just too scared to do it. I, I, just can't, I just can't do it in an entire group because attorneys make me, intimidate me, and I just, those judges are all attorneys and they use all that kind of legalese language. But I am going to go in front of them one at a time, and then when I get comfortable, then I can get and keep, I can keep pushing. And we will. We will. You know, listen, you all are paying lots of tax dollars to put the same addict in jail again. I was just in the jail the other day with one of my therapists visiting a girl, been in for 20 times, doesn't have her kid. Now, this is not helping. So, that's what I'm working on too. But you, taxpayer dollar people, also have a lot of um, power in that. And, um, you know, when you open the door to your loved one being able to be honest and open about their use, because you're not going to be punitive with them or angry with them, but understand it as a disease and that we have treatment here in Cody, you will be making as great an impact as what any of us can make. So I appreciate your time. I'm glad you're here. You do have a little, um, a little, uh, survey questionnaire if you wouldn't mind dropping that off and just tell everybody how warm and wonderful i am i would greatly appreciate it i'm kidding but thanks for coming you are welcome <laughs>